Our first panel today has been invited to tackle the question <coughs> whether the traditional marketplace of ideas is broken, to listen to the suppliers and consumers of ideas in the marketplace of policymaking, one might quickly conclude that the answer is yes. Policymakers often seem to focus on things to the exclusion of ideas, and scholars often seem obsessed with ideas to the exclusion of things. The divide brings to mind the famous quip of Alfred North Whitehead, the British mathematician and philosopher. Whitehead was once asked whether he preferred ideas or things. He replied, ideas about things. Public policy schools such as Fletcher try to crank out ideas about things, but increasingly somewhere between manufacture and delivery, one or the other seems to get sideswiped. The net result is that scholars too, end, uh, too often end up writing what policymakers don't read. Policymakers too often end up taking decisions that scholars can't quite parse. Our question is, why is this so? With all the ease that modern communications provide, how could this gap have arisen? Might it have something to do with the structure of the marketplace of ideas itself? The marketplace paradigm traces famously in American law to the concurring opinion of Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in the 1919 case Abrams versus the United States. Holmes wrote, the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. The ultimate good desired, he wrote, is best reached by free trade in ideas. The question, however, is whether this is really how people think and decide how policymakers make policy. Haven't behavioral economists shown that cognitive error routinely distorts processes of rational decision making? For that matter, isn't the marketplace of ideas like economic marketplaces subject to distortion when concentrations of power emerge that handicap some ideas and give other ideas a head start. So if the marketplace of ideas is broken, what's the source of the market failure? Does the problem lie on the supply side? Do scholars too often trim their sales in hopes of becoming insiders? Or on the other hand, should scholars exert less effort trying to speak truth to power and more effort speaking power to truth by perhaps being more aware of the potentially deleterious effects of true data or true ideas by pulling their punches so as to maintain public order or civic cohesion or social harmony? Is myth sometimes more important to the life of a people than truth? Or is the problem on the demand side? Do policymakers in the age of Twitter simply have less need for ideas? Are books most useful as decor in their TV studios? I have the happy task of posing these questions rather than answering them. We have a very distinguished panel here today to do that. You know who they are from the program, so I won't cut further into their time by reading their bios. Each will speak for 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions. So let's begin with Professor Peter Fever. Well, thank you. It's uh, good to be here. I, I knew I had to accept Daniel's invitation because I persuaded him to come down to Duke to talk about the international politics of Game of Thrones. So uh, if you ever ask Daniel for a favor, you, will, you know you'll get called on in, in return. But this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, so um, I, I leapt at the chance to come and talk about it. 
just to be clear, we're talking, I think if you look at the audience and, and the makeup of the panelists, we're talking about the, the gap as it pertains to the area of security and American foreign policy. That's what almost all of us do. There's a whole other conversation if we were doing econ economics or child and family policy or anything else that are important policy areas, uh, but have a very different uh, transmission belt experience, I think, than the one we have. So the question that is posed to us uh, is, is the marketplace of ideas in the area of national security, American foreign policy, is it broken? And I would say no, it is not broken, but there are some dysfunctions in the marketplace that entrepreneurs can arbitrage uh, uh, if, they're, if they're clever. And I'll mention five dysfunctions that I think are, are worth noting. Uh, these aren't in order of importance. Uh, they're in order of the things that occurred to me uh, early in the morning. Uh, the, the first one is that whereas the policy making community is evenly split, split between people who are relevant when Democrats hold the reins of power and people who are relevant when Republicans hold the reins of power. So in the policy making community you can pretty much uh, fill the sides 50-50 there. Uh, the academy has a pronounced skew. So it's mostly populated by either Democrats who hate Republicans or Democrats who hate Democrats and then the odd Republican <laughs> who hates Republicans and I'm looking at you Dan. So uh, there are exceptions to this that prove the rule but um, and it's also the case that wise Republican administrations will reach out uh, uh, across the aisle to get key academic thinkers regardless of this academic skew. But they do, Republicans do so like uh, the way you eat fish, where you're picking through the bones and, and trying to, to find the meat. So that's a dysfunction that's, that I think contributes to some of the problem that we've been, we will be talking about. The second one is dysfunction is the one that Dan already mentioned, which is that there's two of the three dominant languages in the academy are foreign to the point of unintelligible to most policymakers, and one is unintelligible to policymakers and to policy advisors. So the three languages, there's the first is historical, so um, theoretical, the second is quantitative, and the third is critical theory. And uh, I expect uh, Aaron and, and Michael to talk more about uh, this, so I'll just make a brief observation. Um, uh, virtually no one in the policy making or the policy advising community uses the language of critical theory, uh, which in sheer numbers, if you go to ISA uh, and just you know, swing a dead cat, you're likely to hit more uh, critical theorists than almost any other tribe. Uh, it's a very large in the community of people writing in this space, uh, but that, that's, they're using language that's unintelligible to policy advisors uh, for the most part and policy makers. Uh, quantitative, the second language, uh, many policy advisors uh, can, can speak the language or can at least read the language, uh, but v relatively few policy makers in the national security uh, foreign policy space can. Um, I think it'll get a bad rap. I hope uh, others will speak for it. Um, I know so, um, this is an argument I've had with, with um, well, with Mike Desch, among others, I, I think that there's some very important cutting edge quant work that is very policy relevant. Uh, there's Mike already rising up to, to whack me. Um, uh, so uh, it, it is not the case uh, that you, you either do policy work or you do quant work. You don't do both. I think you can do quant work that is not relevant. You can do quant work that is relevant. The most quantitative work I've done also happens to be the most policy relevant stuff I've done. Um, so I think uh, that that's, can be a misleading uh, concern, but it is the case that the policy makers don't speak that language for the most part. Uh, and so there's a translation challenge. Uh, and then finally, the, the, the language that the policy makers do speak, which is the historical theoretical language, uh, it's, it's totally intelligible to the policy maker uh, but in some ways, that language is in danger inside the academy. Uh, so diplomatic and military historians are endangered species. Uh, we need to uh, protect them, have no more hunting of them. We need to have them fl flourish. Uh, and within the political science, within my home discipline, uh, the, uh, the qualitative historical uh, subgroup of the discipline, 
I think is still struggling to recover from the the internecine battles that were triggered by the Iraq War, in much the way that the Vietnam War uh, caused friction within that community, the Iraq War caused friction within that community, and so people who should be natural methodological or epistemological allies are not. Uh, and so this this language, which works very well and can can be uh, communicated easily to policymakers, has a problem on the academy side, and that's the second big dysfunction. The third big dysfunction that I'd mention is, uh, if you're just zeroing in on the third group, the historical, theoretical uh, folks in the academy, where it's very easy to, to talk to policymakers, I'm struck by how many uh, gaps there are between things policymakers believe are true and things academics in that area believe are true. And I can, I can give you know, a dozen examples, but I'll just list five where, uh, where there's quite a large gap. The first one is credibility studies, uh, the, the importance of credibility. Does, uh, you know, is Mercer and Press right that credibility doesn't matter? Or is every policymaker who's ever been in office right who says credibility does matter? Um, I think the academic research is shifting here, actually. There's two new dissertations out at Duke that challenge key, as, uh, key parts of the, the current um, academic consensus, and so the academic side of that may be moving, but it's nevertheless a very interesting uh, arbitrage opportunity between what policymakers believe to be true and what academics believe to be true. Related, the second one would be the domino theory. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, there's a reason I think the I think the academic debate on domino theory is very sloppy, uh, uh, as sloppy as some of the more sloppy policy claims that were made for it in the 60s. So, if you get people to be precise, the difference between academics and policymakers may actually uh, narrow. But nevertheless, there's an arbitrage opportunity there. A third one, near and dear to many of our hearts, is is proliferation dangerous because of proliferation cascades, or are proliferation cascades nothing to worry about? Uh, big dis disagreement between many academics and many policymakers. Uh, fourth uh, example, can we rebalance easily, uh, sorry, can we rebuild balances of power easily and more cheaply than we can protect them in the first place? So is it, is it more efficient to protect current balances of power uh, or is it cheaper to allow them to fluctuate and then repair them and rebuild them uh, when they go awry? Uh, related, a fifth is, can, uh, do we need to do forward deployment to reassure allies, as has, was thought to be the case for 70 years? Or can you rebuild and reassure allies offshore without, uh, without uh, being onshore? On, on each one of these, and there's a dozen more I could list, the, you can get a a consensus among a, a large group of academics who believe they're talking to policy, and they're saying one thing, and you can get the policymakers who are uh, across between Republican and Democrat, so it's not a partisan split, saying the exact opposite. That's an interesting arbitrage uh, moment there. The fourth dysfunction uh, is uh, this one I'd level at the academics. I think academics can be sloppy in overclaiming the policy implications of their research. So discovering that the US is less likely to initiate war against a state possessing nuclear weapons uh, does not mean that from the policymakers' point of view, it would be a good for more states to get nuclear weapons. I mean, that, that's a case where an academic claim uh, does not lead to the policy implication that the academic who's claiming it would say it does. Or a second example, discovering that a state, a policy tool, a policy tool that a state's using, that's policy tool A, it doesn't matter what it is, has only a 25% success rate, does not mean that it's wrong for the policymaker to use that policy tool A. Because what's more important is to know what is the success rate of the other alternative policy tools that the policymaker is considering. It could be that 25% is actually his best policy or her best policy tool available. So many, many academic studies will say this thing doesn't work three, three fourths of the time, therefore it's, uh, policymakers are wrong to try it. And a policymaker understands, well, 
that's uh, if you bat 250, you can still get employed uh, in the major leagues. Uh, likewise, uh, the th third example, knowing that a long laundry list of factors beyond the policymaker's control are statistically correlated with the success or failure uh, is not as useful uh, to the policymaker as knowing what things the policymaker can do or not do that on the margins increase the prospects of success. So while it's a contribution to knowledge to know about all of these deep structural factors that the policymaker cannot change and that are contributing to success or failure, the policymaker is understandably and rightfully also interested and needs to know about the things that he or she can manipulate. The fifth dysfunction in the marketplace of ideas has to do with the indeterminacy of prediction. And I know I'm guessing Mike uh, will talk more about this kind of thing later, but let me just uh, say my things first so I get credit for saying them. Um, uh, political scientists and policymakers are in the exact same business of prediction. That you can't do policy without making predictions, bets about what will and won't, won't happen. And you don't, you're not doing political science if you're not uh, at some level doing predictions. But there is a lot more, uh, there are more important differences to the way they're doing predictions than I think academics fully realize. And let me just give you three examples. The first is what I call the John Mearsheimer Sarah Palin paradox of predictive success. <laughs> so both Mearsheimer and Palin ha are proudly noting that they correctly predicted Putin's aggression in Ukraine. Uh, and they're right. John called it 20 years ago, and uh, Palin called it in 2008. The policy implications of their predictions are exactly opposite, though. So it's not right, it's, it's not enough to know that they both correctly predicted the invasion. What matters is the underlying theory about the prediction. Uh, and, you know, Sarah Palin was right. Uh, but her the policy implications are completely uh, uh, different, opposite to uh, John's. Uh, and that's an important thing. A second example, um, pol uh, social scientists are in the business of finding probabilistic tendencies over many cases. But policymakers are in the business of figuring out whether the case in hand, the one they're working on right now, fits the central tendency or is the exception. Uh, and since, at best, social science can find probabilistic findings, it's still worth the policymaker's time assessing, am I in the central tendency today, or is this one the exception? And a third example. The, the, from a policy point of view, the best prediction, the most useful prediction, is the self-negating one. The one that says, unless you do X, Y is going to happen, and Y is real bad. So do X, and then Y won't happen. And so the policymaker does X, Y doesn't happen. Observationally, the prediction seems not to have uh, occurred, and so, but from the policy point of view, that's a huge success. But from an academic social science point of view, that's a very, very hard thing to, to, to measure. And that's uh, another reason, I'd say, for the gap between what policymakers are doing and academics are doing. So let me close with the provocation, which is uh, I have many academic friends who think uh, that there's no accountability for being wrong in the policy world. Uh, and thus, the marketplace of ideas in the policy world f fails because you can be wrong and uh, keep your job, and you can uh, get your, when your party gets reelected, you go back in even though you were wrong last time. So the provocation would be this. Is there more or less accountability for being wrong, make that, by which I mean making a bad policy judgment, as opposed to committing academic fraud? So let's leave aside being wrong in the sense of academic fraud. But you make a, your theory makes a policy prediction, and it turns out to be wrong or you're, you, based on all of your knowledge, make a judgment about a policy and you turn out to be wrong. Uh, is there any accountability for that in the academic world? I would say that there's probably more accountability in the policy world for bad policy judgments than there is in the academic uh, 
world for making bad policy judgments. And if that's the case, then the chief causal mechanism behind the marketplace of ideas that you mentioned at the very start doesn't operate. Because you can be wrong, and you can still get invited to conferences, get swag, and talk about it. And uh, if Mike were next, Mike would say, yeah, you're proof of that, Peter. Uh, but instead, <laughs> a better Mike is next, and so I'll turn it over to Mike. I think it's Aaron. Oh, OK. Aaron, Aaron would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so I have a, a number of different ways that we can kind of take, take this discussion. Uh, I think I'm here a bit to, to represent um, some of the quote unquote DC perspective. Um, I have uh, aberrant DC perspectives on, on many of these, of these topics. Um, but I also want to talk about, uh, we've, Peter's talked about sort of the supply side uh, of, of the academy and the marketplace of ideas. And I think it's also important to think about the demand side uh, as, as well. It does indeed take two to tango uh, as folks are trying to have uh, engagements between these various communities. And um, both sides have, have changed um, over, over the years. Um, so I run a small consulting firm in, in Washington. Uh, it's, it's not a think tank. We don't do uh, policy analysis. Uh, in any real way. Um, we do concept development, develop tools, uh, collect a lot of local data for a variety of clients around the world who are trying to make sense of uh, complicated and, and dangerous places. Um, we have the privilege of hiring some really talented folks, uh, ranging from data scientists to Middle East specialists with exceptional language skills. Uh, and every once in a while, we hire PhDs uh, as, as well. People from Fletcher, maybe? Or um, I actually <laughs> interviewed a Fletcher student yesterday for, for a job, um, who was a former translator uh, for the US military in Iraq. He was actually an exceptional human being. Um, interestingly, the demand for PhDs in Washington uh, has, has never been higher, uh, to, at least to, to my mind. It's, it's almost fetishized. Um, everyone wants to hire a, a PhD. They have no idea why they want to hire a PhD. Uh, and I, I've speculated elsewhere that that might be tied to a bit of dissatisfaction with the, the DC master's programs. Um, but they, they have to have one. Um, and it's interesting to think about why that is. Is it just sort of degree inflation or credential inflation? Or is there some sense that there is a set of skills being imparted to quote unquote PhD graduates um, that uh, isn't otherwise being supplied uh, by, by the broader market. Um, I do think that you know, we can, to talk about the, one of the things that uh, academia uh, provides to the broader policy community, and I think it's important to note that there's a lot more that goes on in Washington than just policy making. Um, we don't do any policy work, and yet we're quite busy. Um, there's an intel incredible side of uh, a sort of what I would call what is going on here uh, that, that is also very important to Washington. Some of that's done by the intelligence community, um, which makes folks a little anxious to talk about at, at times. Um, some of that's done by part of the State Department or, or USAID. Uh, but there's a lot more that goes on in Washington than just policy. And I would actually encourage all the students here to you know, dig into that world a bit more. Uh, there's a lot more to Washington life than, than think tanks and, and OSD policy. Um, but one of the things that academia provides is that sort of backbench or kind of kettle warmer for a variety of regions and topics that are not front burner issues for Washington day to day. Um, and there's a number of reasons you know, for what is the front burner issue in, in Washington on any given day or any given month. Um, it is remarkably faddish. Uh, you would hope that there are really good principled reasons why one thing or another uh, was sort of dominated the topic of conversation or dominated a front office in any particular agency. Sometimes there are, uh, but not always. And one of the things that academia is able to provide um, across a range of disciplines are experts in a number of not so hot topics. Academia takes a ding for that, right? You guys are doing things that aren't relevant. Well, it's not relevant this year, but because who, ca who cared about the Ukraine you know, six months ago or six years ago? And oh, wouldn't it be nice if we knew anybody who knew anything about the Ukraine? Well, we do, actually. There are people in you know, East European studies departments you know, across the United States that you know, have studied this you know, intermittently or <laughs> dedicatedly for the last you know, five, 10, or, or even 50 years. Um, terrorism studies is another place, just politics, political violence, that you know, sat in academia and was not a dominant topic of conversation in Washington, oh, until it was. And, and Mia, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit um, later today. If I wanted to be provocative, and, and Dan knows that I usually do, uh, I might, what I might say is that where one place where we see the failure in the marketplace of ideas is on the international relations and security studies side 
of the house in academia. Comparativists are doing very well. Um, the idea of folks who know a particular place, know a particular language, do deep field work in a region, have always been in demand in Washington um, and are routinely consulted um, you know, on, on any number of, of matters, whether at a functional desk or a regional desk for a variety of, of agencies. Uh, also, a lot of the kinds of topics that are dominating political discussions or policy discussions, particularly in the Defense Department, um, related to political violence, protest movements, uh, terrorism, insurgencies, irregular warfare, are all things that uh, many comparativists are much more comfortable talking about than folks who have come up in a more traditional, you know, guns and bombs, IR security studies paradigm. Uh, we work with non-state actors, we talk about control and governance, um, and that's a different paradigm than a lot of the traditional security studies discussion. You know, that said, I think that it's important to look at some of the challenges on the demand side as, as well. Um, I work, I, I left academia, uh, I have a PhD in political science, I wrote a dissertation on counterinsurgency campaigns. Uh, I remember the exact day I decided to leave academia, which was when my department chair, one, introduced herself to me, I was a sixth year in the department, uh, and two, said, counterinsurgency, really? Does anyone care about that? That was in December of 2006. Uh, we had just released the field manual FM324, the new counterinsurgency manual for the Army. Uh, Don Rumsfeld had just been fired for bungling the Iraq War and leading to uh, Senate and House takeover you know, by the Democrats in the midterm elections. Uh, people, in fact, did really care about counterinsurgency, and I was unwilling to sort of fight the uphill fight for the rest of my career in academia to convince other folks that that was important. There were a lot of other people in Washington who cared about it quite a bit at that moment, and I thought that was a good place to sort of... Uh, take my talents to, not quite to South Beach, but to, to Northern Virginia. Um, that said, the demand side is, is, is tricky, right? So we've talked about the jargon-laden academic articles. I love nothing more than listening to people in the Department of Defense criticize academics for jargon. Um, these folks, you know, they can't, they can't get out of bed without saying an, you know, an, an acronym. Uh, and I certainly fall, fall prey to that uh, as, as well. Um, D.C. is paralyzed by the problem of the day, um, very near-term focus, exceptionally busy calendars, um, very little for all the planning processes of the military, which really are impressive at a certain level. Uh, they are still very close to, to the face. Um, one interesting place, sort of a natural experiment where you can see that is to spend some time in RAND's D.C. offices and spend time at RAND Santa Monica. Very, very different cultures, very, very different work products, very, very different orientations to would otherwise seem like similar, similar kinds of problems. Um, the final thing that I think, and it's, a, it's probably a different experience than, than Peter had or, or others here have had, and this you know, relates to um, me working as a consultant in our firm, um, providing advice and, and analysis to a variety of folks in the government. Um, policymakers want to hear what they want to hear, right? Part of the reason, as Peter knows, there are these divergent opinions between you know, what sort of the academics see about something and the policymakers see about something is the policymakers have a policy preference for a particular outcome. Um, they are not super interested in the deep empirical exploration of why they're wrong. Um, because even if they're wrong, that's still going to be the policy. They have relatively few means to, to change that at some, at some level. And that, that is a place where, you know, you want to engage, you want to do a meaningful thing, you want to evaluate the effectiveness of aid programs, you want to do forecasting of, of political instability and violence. Um, you don't always get the sense that you're being listened to. Um, which is not, you know, it's not the indictment of any one particular client or any one given agency, but it is um, a challenging feature of trying to push forward something that you believe to be accurate and useful and thoughtful and true, um, and it may just not matter. Um, there's a, a, a real confirmation bias in a lot of ways in terms of dealing with policymakers. It's not just the fact that academics are, uh, you know, out of touch or obtuse or reading, you know, full of jargon language. Uh, it's, there is, in fact, a real disconnect about what people want and what their professional priorities are in terms of how they manage that, that interaction. Um, I think I'll end just by, by saying we talk about, you know, what are the ideas of academia? And we can talk about them in terms of uh, particular norms of the democratic peace or, you know, these kind of concepts that we have in international relations and even comparative politics. And I think it's actually important to step back and think about what are the real core 
um, norms or ideas of the broader enterprise of, of academic research. Um, certainly in my case is a commitment to empiricism, right? Facts matter. What's actually happening should matter. Um, a commitment to falsifiability. How would you know if you were wrong? A question that very few policymakers ask themselves for the most part. Um, military professionals can be a little bit more inclined to do so in my experience, but a fundamental question that drives both policymaking and really good research, right? What would I need to see in the world in order to update my assessment of what's going on here? Uh, and finally, a commitment to, to replicability. How could somebody else get a similar result? Or have I overcooked the sauce in a way to guarantee that my client hears what they want to hear or that my dissertation committee hears what they want to hear? Um, those are the real ideas of academia, and I think there's an incredible opportunity, especially in this world of big data, just dominated by computer scientists and engineers, for social scientists to bring these understandings of empiricism and falsifiability, you know, even a little bit of the data generating process, you know, to that conversation, and certainly not one that we should abandon lightly. Thanks. Thank you. Mike. Great. Thanks very much. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so. Uh, I apologize. There's some uh, there are some slides in front of you on the on the table. When Dan asked me to do this, uh, I quickly wrote back and said, "Dan, I can't produce a paper for this conference. Uh, do you still want me if all I can give you is very colorful, 40 very colorful PowerPoint slides?" And he said, "That's exactly what I want." And then last <laughs> week we got an email saying, "No PowerPoint." So this is the compromise. What you have in front of you is these five pages of, of compromise. So I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, the supply side. Uh, really give you a helicopter view of how m one might start thinking about the supply side. Uh, what is it that academia provides? Uh, specifically, what is it that the IR subfield of political science provides to the public and to policymakers? Uh, and so, yeah, I'm just going to give you a helicopter view of that, R really raise more questions than I will provide answers. This is not going to be a coherent talk. This is going to be a series of, of notions and ideas. So uh, both Dan and Michael have already referred to some of what I would call the conventional wisdom about the gap or the problem uh, with academic IR as it relates to policymaking. Uh, I think if there are five sort of nuggets that you can distill out of this, the things that people have focused on is some combination of international relations is too theoretical or abstract, it's too formal, and I think we're going to hear more about that on a panel today, it's too quantitative. We're not interested in policy questions, we're interested in other questions, or it's something about the internal mechanisms of the discipline that's changed, it's become too professionalized. These first three bullet points, uh, uh, I'm part of a project that I'm going to describe briefly, and we can, we can describe change over time, we can describe change across space, we can describe change uh, across different institutions uh, with respect to these first three bullet points. Uh, but we don't, I don't have a particular normative theory built in, so I can't tell you if, if something is too theoretical or too quantitative. I can just tell you if the field is becoming more or less quantitative, more or less formal, and in what subfields that's occurring. Um, so the, the second slide looks at the relationship between three different uh, features of international relations, teaching, research, and policy or politics. I would expand the lower right-hand uh, box to include uh, practitioners. I think uh, Aaron makes a great point about what's going on in Washington. And most, of, I would argue that most, the vast majority of the work that's done by professional political scientists uh, when they're working with people in government or in NGOs or IOs is not about policy making. It's not about giving a policy maker a great new idea or a great new analytic tool. It's for the practitioners. It's for the people who do actual work, whether they're in the DOD or the USAID or the intelligence community. Uh, and so we, we, I think, try to capture that uh, in, the, in, in our approach. Um, IR scholars have talked about the, the relationships between teaching, research, and policy for a long time. The conversation usually takes place in the bar at ISA or APSA. But, you know, it's kind of striking that we've rarely used the methods of social science to try to th either describe data that's in these other two boxes or to think about how we could design research to understand causal relationships between them. And so I would just say in brief, we're dedicated to doing that. Um, uh, there's two types of data collection that the TRIP project is primarily involved in. One is surveying international relations scholars, 
And increasingly, I hope with uh, some collaborators, we will increasingly be surveying policymakers rather than just international relations scholars. Surveying them, asking them about the discipline, about their teaching, about their research, and their views on policy making and, and policy issues. Uh, and the second is a journal article database, which I think of as the, it's the jewels of the crown. It's something that we can really use to understand our discipline and where we've been and where we're going. Uh, the surveys we've started in 2004 with just the United States, and today I'm only going to talk about results from the U.S. surveys. Uh, in 06, we expanded it to Canada, 08 to 10 countries, in 20, 2011 to 20 countries, and in August of 2014, this year, we'll do 34 different countries, including all of the BRICS. Uh, we have a fairly narrow definition of what an IR scholar is, uh, and we're thinking mostly about people who contribute to teaching or research in the subfield of IR in political science. Uh, Jim Goldgeier and others have rightly uh, uh, pointed out the limitations of the TRIP data because there's lots of smart people who don't have PhDs who study or do international relations and many who have PhDs in other fields. And a lot of those people live in policy schools like Fletcher and we are not surveying those people. Uh, maybe, we'll, maybe that will change in the near future. Uh, the journal article database looks only at the top 12 peer-reviewed journals in political science. So any data that you hear from me today regarding trends in publication comes from these 12 peer-reviewed journals. If you ask IR scholars what are the most important journals in their field, they don't give you this list of 12. Uh, they only about nine or 10 of these. And they also mention journals like Foreign Affairs and Foreign Policy, which we do not code or categorize. However, as I'll describe at the end of my talk, uh, we're going to start doing that this summer. Uh, the journal article database covers 28 different variables you might care about, some of which have been referred to. I'm not going to talk about them here. I think the way to start thinking about this and to answer the question from this panel uh, is to look at the results of two questions on the 2011 survey. Uh, the first says, what statements comes closest to representing your views on the relationship between the kind of research IR scholars produce and the kind of research that the policy community finds most useful? Only 14% of IR scholars believe that the gap between the policy community and academia is shrinking. About four times more believe that it is growing. So the conventional wisdom that describes a growing gap uh, between the IR community and policymakers, this is at least a view that is shared by the vast majority of political scientists in the United States. The second, when you pair that with the second result, it's even more troubling and speaks more directly to the, the issue on this panel. Which statement comes closest to representing your views on the ideal relationship between the academy and the policy community? Only 8% of US IR scholars think there should be a higher wall of separation between these two communities. We should be able to do basic research. We shouldn't be worried about power. Uh, we should be focused on describing and explaining the world. I would have guessed that number would be much higher. Uh, there are devotees in every political science department who say, Any, if you're doing policy work, you're not serious. I would have thought that would be much higher. 92% of our colleagues believe that there should be more uh, opportunities for interaction between policy, the policy community and uh, academia. So at least scholars believe that. Uh, if you look, another qu question from the survey asks whether you do basically applied research, you do basic research, or do you do applied research? And what we see is slight trends away from applied research. So for Dan and people who are concerned about this, uh, the trends are not moving in the right direction. Again, some of the conventional wisdom looks like it's reflected in at least some of these answers. Uh, that people are giving. I, I could provide you other evidence that looks like it might be pointing in the opposite direction. Again, we have no baseline metrics to say, you know, if it's above X percent, it's good. If it's below, it's bad. Uh, what we can show is change over time, and I can show you uh, sort of what percentage of people are actually consulting with, for the U.S. government. 20 percent of your colleagues have consulted in a paid capacity for the U.S. government within the last five years. That was surprising to me. And if you add NGOs and international organizations and foreign governments, the number gets up to almost 48% of IR scholars have worked in a paid capacity for some policy making or at least practitioner unit in the world. Uh, we have no good measure for policy relevant research in the TRIP project. This is very annoying to me. And it's, we are very short sighted in 2004 
Uh, we have one clear metric uh, it, when we're looking inside of journal articles, uh, and that metric is whether or not the author makes an explicit policy prescription. So what follows from my analysis of aid projects in Afghanistan is that the U.S. government should do X. Right? And that's the only measure we have, prescription, and it's a very, in my view, a very blunt measure. But uh, the, the, the next slide here on, on page four shows that while we started in 1980 with a very low percentage of policy prescriptions per journal article, uh, it started around 15%, we're now down to under 5%. So no one in these top 12 journals is making policy prescriptions. The upper line here that starts at 30% is international security. So I think more people in this room are in, working in the subfield of IR that you might call, they call themselves international security. Um, and so there are more policy prescriptions there, but it's still declining over time. Uh, I think a lot of this, uh, a lot of these results are driven by the fact that international security, the journal international security, is one of the journals that's in this, uh, in this sample. And if you took that particular journal out, I think international security would look much more like the rest of IR. Um, IPE is even less enthusiastic nowadays about making policy prescriptions. The next three terrible pie graphs simply show the same thing, is that if you take the whole data set over the last 30 years, there are very few policy prescriptions in our peer-reviewed research. Uh, one thing I'll, I'll return to at the end is to suggest that while some people claim that the top journals in our field are a good representation of our discipline, uh, they, they certainly represent the, uh, the, the, the cutting edge portion of our discipline. Uh, our discipline, you know, people in our discipline, even those who publish in peer-reviewed journals, do lots of other things. They publish books, they write in foreign affairs, they write in Washington Quarterly, they blog, etc. So having scanned ahead and looked at uh, some of the future panels that we'll have at this conference, I was interested to know uh, what IR scholars thought about blogging as a way of engaging either the policy community or the public, trying out ideas. And one of the questions, and I believe uh, Dan and Charlie Carpenter are responsible for this question on the 2011 trip survey, asked whether or not blogging should be counted in your merit evaluation. Should blogging be counted as service to the discipline? Should it be counted as part of your research? And one of the things that truly shocked me was about 25% of IR scholars believe that blogging should be counted as part of your merit uh, of, in terms of your research output. Uh, and if you do the cross tabs on this and look at who thinks that should count. And by the way, I think if you did this in 2014, which we probably will, I'll bet you this number goes up even more. If you look at who thinks it should be counted, those people doing applied research by about 12% are much more likely to think blogging should count, and those doing basic research are less likely to think so. No, no surprise that those people who blog regularly think it should count. Uh, that's the next slide, and those who don't, don't. The slide that I was missing here for you is age. So I think, at least for me, just normatively, I'm somewhat more optimistic. Uh, the crosstab on age shows that younger academics, and remember, these are the people who are, because of the professionalization of the discipline, uh, per Mearsheimer, these are the people who have to publish in peer-reviewed journals now. They are much more excited and much more enthusiastic about blogging, and they think academics should get credit for blogging. Uh, so anyway, that may come up in our, in our conversation later. Uh, I got 30 of these next slides, and, uh, which just take specific ideas or paradigms or issue areas or regions of study and show how that changes over time and also shows how it changes by age. What this slide shows is that there are no young realists left. Uh, so if you're young and you want to be a realist, that's either an opportunity uh, or you could say, well, the, yeah, that's right, the, uh, the tide is going in the wrong direction. Uh, I think methodology is something we're definitely going to talk more about uh, today, and I think Peter talked, on it, talked about it quite usefully uh, in terms of uh, what is consumable or not consumable by the policy community. Um, and again, what we're measuring here is the methods used in a journal article, and you can use more than one method in a journal art article. Policymakers probably aren't reading journal articles. But the insights that we get from our research published in journal articles, we may repackage in another format. But if all we're looking at is the supply side, what are we getting, what methods are we using, what we see is a dramatic decrease in descriptive work that's published in these journals. It's just very difficult to get published in any of these journals if all you're doing is 
describing a data set or grubbing around in quantitative data and looking for relationships or you know, describing what happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Those just simply aren't published in these journals anymore. They were at 40% in 1980 and now we're down to 2 or 3%. What we have seen is a dramatic increase in quantitative analysis. So if you're using statistics to analyze relationships across all subfields in IR, that's going up, but especially in IPE. It's virtually impossible now for, to get published in any top peer-reviewed journal if you're not doing quantitative analysis. Uh, formal theory uh, had its heyday in, in the 90s and has now declined and has been steady over the last 15 years at around 15% of total articles published. The one thing you do not see, which sh a surprises me in a little bit, is through 2012's experiments have not yet spiked. If any of you were on a search committee this year, you know that this is about to change. Mm -hmm. right? So this has already happened in other subfields of political science, especially American comparative. But there is a wave, perhaps a fad, but there is a huge wave of research coming that uses survey experiments, lab experiments, and randomized control trials and field experiments. It's especially pronounced in the field that I work in, in international development. Uh, OK, so last two, two thoughts. Uh, first, I wanted to talk about uh, new initiatives that we, new things we're trying to do within the TRIP project. Uh, so very briefly, some of you have been nice enough to respond to serve, uh, SNAP polls. So we're now sending out surveys to IR scholars that take about two to three minutes to complete. And these SNAP polls are designed to get the opinions of IR scholars to see whether or not there's an epistemic consensus on certain ideas, descriptive, proscriptive, prescriptive. Uh, ideas that are relevant to sort of very contemporary news-worthy items. And the idea here is twofold. One is, truth be told, I want data that I can use in my analysis to learn things about our discipline, but also the idea is to spur public debate uh, where IR scholars as a group, not as individuals, but IR scholars as a group are held up and said, this is what IR scholars think about the defense budget. This is what 83% uh, of IR scholars believe that, you know, this is what the Obama administration should do in Syria, right? We see these kind of surveys all the time among climate scientists and economists. There are no surveys like this uh, among our peers. And so if one of the tasks of making IR more policy relevant or more publicly relevant would be to get uh, more IR scholars engaged in that public conversation, but also to get normal people uh, to understand what IR scholars believe and why they believe it. Second, and this is a great, this follows up really nicely from uh, some of Peter's comments. I think the debate about the gap and this sort of policymaker academia debate has been dominated by uh, what I would call sort of the international security branch or the US foreign policy branch of international relations. And I will bet you, I don't know this, but I will bet you that the relationships between the academy and Washington vary by issue area. And in some issue areas, in foreign aid, you know, the gap may be shrinking. In trade, it may be even worse. Uh, or in foreign direct investment, it may be focused much more on economists, et cetera. So one of the projects we're engaged in now is to sort of break this down by issue area and, and sort of analyze how that's changed over time, but also uh, think about uh, how we can compare across different issue areas, because maybe we'll learn different things. We're now coding uh, books and, uh, by the way, both those projects that I just described are funded by the Carnegie Corporation. So the, I think I have Steve Del Rosso to thank for uh, pushing us in this direction to focus more on the policy side than on the academia side. We're now coding policy journals and books because I think our discipline is written in books as well as journals. Uh, we're trying to understand in a systematic way what is funded, to what supports IR research by external funders, and that's changed pretty dramatically over time. And because the Carnegie Corporation agreed to support some of this, they said, we'll only do it if you make this data publicly available within two years and do it in a format that non-computers and non-econometricians can engage it and use it. So it can't just be, here's my state of file, go. It has to be an interactive website where normal human beings, undergraduates, or my mom could log on and sort of understand what does this mean? What, where are these trends? What would happen if I did this dynamic cross tab? Last slide, final thoughts. Your, mom, your mom's really into dy dynamic cross tabs. My mom is all about dynamic cross tabs, <laughs> especially if they're geospatially located. Um, last thought on the market for ideas. Uh, first, and this is all impressionistic. I have no evidence to support this, so this is just me bloviating. First, 
uh, when I look at the landscape of what is being funded by the U.S. government and by multilateral development organizations and by private foundations, I would say the support for basic research is declining. It's more and more difficult to get support for basic research. I don't know about your universities, but even internal funding from my university, it's easier to get that money if you can wave a flag and say, this matters in the real world. This is policy relevant. I can save children in R Rwanda. Uh, and the support for basic research is declining. This is certainly the case if you look at less research uh, funding for the NSF, or you look at Title VI and Title VIII funding that's been cut for the area studies programs that uh, Aaron was talking about earlier. On the other hand, there's more money now, I would argue, at least in my little corner of the world, there's more money for applied research. So if you look at Minerva, right, DOD funding for Minerva, you know, sort of harnessing the insights of the eggheads in academia, to quote uh, Chancellor Gates, the Chancellor of William and Mary, by the way. Uh, you know, so there's more money out there for doing applied research. Higher Education Solutions Network, which is now the U.S. Global Development Lab, right? So USAID funding went from under 100 million a year for science, technology, and research to now over about 700 million dollars a year. And just in three or four years, that's a sudden shift. And you only get that money if you're doing applied research. And most of it, by the way, is not qualitative. It, most of it has to do with big data, field experiments, uh, inter interdisciplinary collaboration, et cetera. Second point, selection effects. I think the, the person who's done the best, so what we really should have been asking for the last 10 years is what do policymakers think is the best research or the most useful research? What do they use in their jobs? And we hear those stories all the time at the bar, but nobody's really collected systematic evidence on that. Mike Desch in 2011 did what I think is still the best elite survey of policymakers. But even there, look at the selection effects. So Mike started by trying really hard to get a wide variety of folks in the US government, right? And then I think the short version is the State Department said no, CIA said no, all these different, and the commerce is out, treasury's out, and what we ended up with was a much narrower sample. So the responses that you get in your surveys are gonna be dependent on who you ask, a, a point that Goldgeier has made to me many times. I think that's right. Same thing is true on what you measure. If you're measuring peer-reviewed journal articles, right, you're gonna get very different perspective on what the discipline looks like than if you're measuring foreign affairs, Washington Quarterly, foreign policy. Final, I actually do real research in IR. I don't just study other academics and <laughs> stare at my navel all day. And my impression uh, in my little corner of the world, which is foreign aid and development, my impression is that uh, the government right now and the World Bank right now are trying to fund scientific breakthroughs, right? So they, they literally say, if you don't, we, you, we got a high risk tolerance, but if you don't come up with sort of fundamental breakthroughs that change the way we understand development, we're gonna pull your funding, right? And so these, and these kinds of claims and arguments they're making are, don't fit nicely with my isms that I teach my IR students, right? They want us to do interdisciplinary work with geographers, area study specialists, and computer scientists to figure out what works in development. Last point I would like to make is um, that it's not just ideas. I think this is a great conference and we should be talking about ideas and the idea industry, but when I see what is being demanded by government, increasingly they'd love to have my ideas, they'd love to have fancy computer science tools but what they oftentimes really want is data. They want evidence uh, to do for their own nefarious purposes. And, uh, you know, so we are, in addition to coming up with good ideas and having time to sort of think hard about important issues, we're also really good at using systematic procedures for collecting evidence so that we know what the evidence means when we analyze it. Uh, and so I think that's another area where uh, we can supply things that matter to the policy making. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Michael. We have 20 minutes for questions. Um, please wait until you get the microphone because we're on video. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for all your presentations. Perhaps um, you could begin by identifying yourself. Sorry. I, I'm Thanks. Mia Bloom. I'm a professor at uh, University of Massachusetts Lowell campus. Um, there was just uh, very much enjoyed your comments and of course uh, as everyone prepared their comments other than these fabulous slides of which I'm envious um, There's probably going to be a lot of duplication over the course of the day So um, I just want to direct one question to Mike Tierney and it's more of a comment than a question I think it's important that as with your final thoughts 
that when you say basic research and when Minerva says basic research, you're talking about two different things. Basic research, the Minerva money that everyone finds out tomorrow if they got or not, um, <laughs> is 6.1. 6.1 is basic. When you say applied, that's 6.2. That's something completely different, and that's nothing that any IR scholar is ever going to be a part of, because what it is is applied research by government standards is building a tool. And I've only done one thing for the government for 6.2, and I'm not allowed to talk about it. But all the research that I've done um, for Minerva, OSD, Office of Naval Research, all of that was basic research, and it all falls into line about what you consider to be basic research and not what you call applied. Now, whether there is an application that's, I think, the crux of the matter. I think in each of these applications, whether it's for Department of Justice NIJ proposals that are due next month, or the Minerva, or any of the other ones, there is an element of, so what? You know, if we come up with something that once again reasserts that balance of power is the, you know, the premier systemic organization and is better than multipolarity, I don't think that's going to answer the so what question anymore. But I do think that I think part of the, the point that Dr. Fever made is that we are sometimes using the same words to connote completely different processes. So that was the only thing I just wanted to, um, kind of a small corrective. If I could follow up on that, Mia, I think that one, one of the things that I've certainly experienced um, having received zero training or exposure to the broader US government research and development community while a grad student and now running a company that devotes a great deal of time to those endeavors, um, there's actually, one, more money than you could possibly imagine, uh, and two, a lot of really interesting people to work with who don't know they are hungry for social science, but absolutely are. Um, so we've worked on a couple of flagship DARPA programs, IARPA, which is the Intelligence Communities Advanced Research Projects Agency, um, the Minerva money, you know, as, as, as you mentioned. A lot of folks are not familiar with how to put together, this is not a grant proposal, it's different from an NSF proposal, um, you often have to work with industry partners, especially if there's classified material involved, um, but it's a place that I would encourage both the students and a lot of the faculty to spend more time engaging with. There's a DARPA Junior Scholars Program that is incredibly good, um, and they, these, all these offices are staffed by engineers and need social scientists, and it's an incredible place for people like in this room to, to engage. for Dr. Fever. Uh, could you elaborate please, a bit? Please on... identify yourself. Thank oh, you. Uh, I'm Rob Farley from Patterson School, University of Kentucky. Um, uh, could you elaborate a bit on your comments with respect to the impact of the Iraq war on the discipline of political science and especially in methodology in political science? Because it, it was an interesting comment, but you didn't really, I think, have time to develop it. And so if you could, I would be appreciative. Sure. Uh, it will, I was comparing it to uh, the Vietnam War, which, which uh, had a poisonous effect in the security studies community for a generation. And you talk to people like Dick Betts, uh, who was, was a bridging in that, and he, he, the 70s were a very, very difficult time uh, for people who did security studies. The, de the internecine debate among security studies in Iraq was not as poisonous as Vietnam, in part because the public debate wasn't as poisonous, but it was poisonous enough. And people who are uh, doing uh, policy relevant, speak to policy, going back and forth uh, to the policy world, uh, on one side of the Iraq war debate, w should be natural allies with people who are doing policy relevant work, want to narrow the gap, but we're on the other side of, say, the Iraq uh, war question. Uh, and uh, they're not. Uh, they are not, um, uh, I think they're still dealing with the, the sort of side effects about uh, arguments that got, in some sense, got personalized. So I, that, that's what I'm talking about. This is, I think it's an issue that affects people of, of a certain age. Uh, when I, my, uh, my graduate students, you know, my PhD students in their 20s, they're not affected by this. So it may be something that's the 35 to 55 or, or 60 crowd that uh, were, the you know, Iraq war happened at a crucial point of their professional life. Um, but the, uh, so it may, this may pass uh, relatively quickly, but I think it has, 
uh, set back uh, a little bit this particular dialogue because these are people who otherwise would share a lot uh, uh, in common when it comes to the importance of, of speaking to policymakers. Up in the front, please. Thank you. Uh, Jim Goldgeier from American University. Uh, Mike, you briefly mentioned, and you had the one slide on um, how people uh, think about the role of blogging in terms of evaluating uh, work. And uh, I'm going to talk more this afternoon about that, um, you know, even at the policy schools, uh, people are evaluated still in very traditional ways, and this is a big constraint on, on, uh, on the work that people are doing. But I do feel like we're at a point uh, where... You know, given the technologies and given, you know, younger scholars wanting to get ideas out sooner rather than later, that, you know, we could see real rapid change in the way we think about um, the range and the type of work people are doing. You know, when we were younger scholars, I mean, if we had an idea and, you know, you waited two years for the thing to come out in a journal, I mean, you just waited two years till the thing came out in a journal and maybe, you know, you could do a working paper along the way or something like that, but you just didn't really have any options. I mean. If I were a younger scholar today, no way would I have that kind of patience uh, to wait for some journal uh, to put my idea out there two years later. And I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get them out. Uh, you know, I've got an idea, I did the research, I've got something to say, I'm putting it out there. And um, so, you know, that just seems like that's gonna get, be more and more the norm. And while it may take a while for places to catch up, I think people are really gonna have to grapple with this question of, of how we do evaluations of research uh, when the traditional venues are simply too slow. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, Daniel Dresner, Fletcher. Um, I've got a question for each of you, actually. Uh, for Peter's point about, and I, I think you're, you raise a valid point about the idea that there might be anger about whether or not policymakers pay a price if they're wrong, but do academics have to pay a price? you know, if they make a theoretical prediction and it turns out to be wrong. But I would so argue in some ways maybe there's something else going on, which is academics, I don't think, tend to be get upset at policymakers who make mistakes because they usually do wind up paying a political price in terms of their reputation. I think their anger is more directed at pundits or op-ed columnists. There's this whole separate category of people that are, dear God, I'm sorry I'm using this word, thought leaders, um, that are not in government but nevertheless sort of articulate these things, and it seems like their sinecures are almost, you know, you, you require large amounts of explosives to eject them from their sinecures. And I, I wonder if that's part of the, the anger that academics have, and I'm wondering if you could talk about sort of that community as well. Um, for Aaron's points, which I really valued, I take your point about DC being faddish, but I kind of wonder the academy is kind of faddish too. Um, you know, Mike's point about how everyone is now, you know, hiring anyone who can do a randomized control trial, you know, and don't get me wrong, that's, there's merit in that, but, but you can see how this is going to probably, we're going to move to the law of diminishing margin returns very, very quickly on that. Um, and then to Mike, the question I have is, I take your point about academics not making policy prescriptions, but I wonder if that's always the most important thing that academics can do um, in terms of influencing the policy world. So, I mean, I've, I've said this before. The article that I wrote in a scholarly journal that's had the biggest impact, as near as I can tell, was a piece I wrote for international security about whether China owning large amounts of U.S. debt caused China to have leverage over the United States. I didn't make a policy prescription in that article. What I was trying to say was, hey, you in D.C. that really believe this is important, it's actually not that important. Um, and I've, I've been told by, you know, people in D.C. that actually did, you know, sort of change their minds on that. I didn't make a policy prescription in there, but in some ways I think correcting a misperception, if you can do it, is in some ways even more valuable than actually making a specific policy prescription about a point. Yes, please uh, feel free. Actually, we found your zombie work the most uh, helpful for uh, Dan. Uh, I'll talk right into that one. Yeah, uh, the, uh, yes, exactly. The, um, I, I actually did mean policymakers. I was, I was had in mind uh, someone who, uh, a friend of mine who's who's flat out said people who disagreed with him on certain policy issues should not be allowed to be in policy making, policy advising positions ever again. And if that if they're not, then there's no accountability as far as he's concerned. But so that's who I was thinking of. But but you're you're right that the the pundits um, operate in a different space. I, I remember reading. 
uh, just so happened to be reading first President Bush's comments about the, um, not Bush, sorry, President Obama's comments about the, the quote unquote uh, deal with, with Russia on Ukraine last week, side by side with a prominent columnist's comment, uh, p column on the exact same thing. And Obama was all, well, you know, we're not really confident. We, I'm not sure we can trust them. And, and he was as caveated and careful as, as you could ever be while the, uh, the uh, pundit said, mission accomplished. This is great compromise. This is a brilliant success, stunning uh, achievement for, for Obama. Uh, and then, then, you know, he had a calm two days later, and he's, you know, still in, in business. The one thing, though, that has changed, uh, th th this is what the social media, what your world, Twitter, et cetera, has done, mostly for ill, but I think, but partly for good is Thanks, Dan. Calling, calling people out on that, right? So and I, you've, you've contributed to this with your disdain for uh, Thomas Friedman and, and others, columnists who, na who 20 years ago probably were never criticized and now are criticized, if not in print, they're at least criticized in bits and bytes uh, at the same time that they're saying what they're saying. So I actually think that if you're in that, operating in that space, the, it, it may not be accountability, and it certainly doesn't hurt their speaker's fees at all, uh, but they are ne nevertheless being called out when they do uh, or say dumb things. And so that, in that sense, there's a marketplace of ideas in some ways, I think, more vigorous for pundits than it is for academics, unless academics cross over and become a pundit. There's also now PunditTracker.com. Professor Desch. Really? Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Mike Desch, the University of Notre Dame. Uh, just three quick questions uh, for Mike Tierney. Um, your selection effects argument, uh, I just need to hear another sentence about that. Are you saying uh, that uh, our piece only gauges national security decision makers, so the uh, findings are only applicable to, yeah, okay. Um, so the question would be, I mean, uh, you know, that's an uh, eminently reason reasonable point. Uh, how are you going to take that on? Is that going to be another front in the, uh, the Great Trips War? Are you going to get Bob Zellick to write an intro email and, uh, uh, reach out to uh, a pool of, uh, you know, foreign economic policy makers and ask the same question. Uh, second issue, and again, more on the, uh, the TRIPS uh, to-do task. Uh, an argument that one could make, and, you know, people have made, uh, again, uh, in response to uh, our piece, is to say, uh, okay, uh, maybe policy makers don't look at this stuff, but what about policy advisors or people lower in the food chain, and that's, you know, strikes me as a, uh, a reasonable uh, supposition. How would you show that? I mean, how would you go about uh, documenting that uh, and doing it uh, in a way that would be compelling, uh, that wouldn't just be, you know, sort of anecdotes, you know, I did some consulting on big data, ipso facto, uh, big data must uh, matter. Um, the big question, though, is uh, the measure of policy relevance. Uh, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, I've heard you and Sue brief on the, uh, the, the journal findings before, and I thought a lot about uh, Lee Siegelman's uh, essay in the uh, millennial, uh, not millennial, centennial <laughs> edition uh, of the APSR where he tried to do uh, a similar sort of thing in terms of uh, a, a tracking over time changes in, uh, in policy relevance. Uh, and I agree with you, you know, in one sense that the are there policy prescriptions is a bit of a blunt instrument. On the other hand, what's the alternative? It seems to me there's one other alternative, which is you could not look at journal articles at all, but you could ask the consumer. But, you know, that's not perfect as well either. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the Dresner point, which I, I've heard him make before about uh, his IS piece dealing with a very important issue, but, you know, not making uh, policy recommendations per se, you know, maybe that's, uh, you know, maybe another way to go back and code it, although given, you know, how massive your project was, you know, that might be uh, prohibitive. But I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts, because I think you're right. Uh, there's no perfect answer, but the question is, could there be a perfect 
Yeah, I'll start with your last one since it, it, it deals directly with the question that Dan asked me. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, policy prescription is one specific, clear, systematic way to measure something that is probably not getting at very much. And that's, you know, again, I think it's incredibly short-sighted on our part to start doing that 10 years ago, but that's what we did. So going back and looking at seven, reopening seven to 8,000 journal articles and recoding them for something else is, sounds painful. I'm uh, talking to someone at Harvard who does, uh, you know, auto-coding. Uh, Brandon Stewart does this auto-coding, and he claims it's smarter than humans anyway. So I'm, I'm really hoping he has a, a quick solution. He's smarter than most humans, too. Uh, hoping he can, he can solve the problem. But, uh, Dan, I agree with you and Mike entirely, uh, and I have the exact same, exact same experience. So mm -hmm. have done, with the Aid Data Project, there's no policy prescription in this story, but it leads directly to changing the way both the World Bank and the USAID do their work, and it leads to millions and millions of dollars for a data uh, to, to, to support basic research. And the idea was, if we can geolocate all of the active World Bank uh, projects in Kenya, and then overlay that with poverty, and just show the map to uh, the vice president for Africa, and they see that the money is not going to the most impoverished places, which is what their policy says it's supposed to do. I mean, it really raises questions. It's, it's stunning. And so there was not only no policy prescription on our part, there was no analysis. <laughs> All we did was show them facts uh, in, in a different format. Other people had written this, and they'd had regression models, and, you know, these guys didn't understand it. You showed it to them on a map, totally changed the conversation at the World Bank. And it led to USAID demanding that they be able to do the same thing with their work and that they'll be able to see where all the other donors are operating in country X. So I totally agree with you. How are we gonna measure that in a systematic way? I, at a loss, my students presented last week on this exact same thing, and they were all annoyed at how bad the dependent variable was. And, and I said, look, well, what can we do this summer to try to think about ways to capture policy-relevant research inside and outside these journals without, you know, without going back and doing literally thousands of hours of, of manual labor? Sorry, last point, Zelic, et cetera, pick the issue. I would love that, uh, Mike. I think that's what we would need to do if we want to take these different issue areas seriously. But as far as I know, no one has done that. They've asked, no one has asked the policy consumers of these ideas what they want in other issue areas. But I, it may just be my ignorance. But I would love to do that, Mike. Can I, can I piggyback? Because I, I, I want to flip the question around. Should all the, f the following three things be treated equally as a academic contributing to a policy. I I'll describe three things that I saw, three anecdotes. Uh, I my answer would be they are all policy relevant academic research or academics talking to policy, but they were, they were done in three totally different ways, uh, probably all within a week of each other. So one was uh, President Bush reads um, uh, Savage war in time of peace, and and thinks that this the, the Algerian experience gives him some ways of thinking about what he's wrestling with with uh, Iraq, and wants to speak with Sir Alistair Horn. And so we arrange to have him come in, and they spend an hour talking about the book, talking about everything, uh, uh, but but directly inspired by having read an uh, you know, academic type book. The second one uh, illustration was uh, so a staffer tells President Bush he needs to read a certain book that, that the president hadn't known about, uh, so it wasn't already on his reading list, but that, that staffer, because of his own uh, academic research, knew it and knew that it was speaking directly to what the ex president was experiencing that week, and so brings it in. Uh, does it? And the third one was an intelligence product that goes up very, very high to the senior policymakers that has a footnote that's opaque, but I could, I'm could i reading the footnote and it says, oh, that's Bruce Buena de Mesquita in that footnote. Uh, and I just, just out of curios idle curiosity, I call back to our uh, you know, customer support person and they pull the thread, yeah, yeah. That was BDM's work that made its way into a footnote which gets reported to the policymaker as a key intelligence insight. But the policymaker, if you had surveyed the policymaker, wouldn't, wouldn't have known. They would have said, yeah, I talked to Sir Alistair Horn, the historian, but I would never, ever listen to BDM, the uh, 
modeler, and yet they, that same week, each, each of those three things. So I would say that's equal. That should be coded equally as mm -hmm. academics speaking to policy. And would you agree or not? Yeah. Ask me on the next panel. I, okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have time for only one final question, so I'll ask it. Oh, we uh, got a student. No, we got to let a student. Uh, no, we don't. We can take it from Mike's time. <laughs> they have time for questions. I've got to go to class. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is an excerpt from the review that appeared in the New York Times two days ago of uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren's new book, and it's a paragraph in which she relates a conversation with uh, Larry Summers, and I'd like to get the panel's reaction to this. After dinner, Larry leaned back in his chair and offered me some advice, Ms. Warren writes. I had a choice. I could be an insider or I could be an outsider. Outsiders can say whatever they want, but people on the inside don't listen to them. Insiders, however, get lots of access and a chance to push their ideas. People, powerful people, listen to what they have to say, but insiders also understand one unbreakable rule. They don't criticize other insiders. Question, is this essentially how it works? Do uh, students here interested in going into policy making fields or becoming scholars have to choose between being an insider or an outsider? Well, I, I've been both. So I've been a uh, quasi-insider uh, for parts of my career, and I've been uh, most of my time on the outside. What, uh, what I would note is that uh, and I'm looking at, at Jim. Every once in a while, you know, over a beer at a conference, Jim and I will say, because we both had similar inside experiences, there are some things that make sense to us, even though we were served at different times, that because we saw it from a certain perspective that makes sense to us that don't make sense to our friends and colleagues who haven't served. The, maybe we're wrong and they're right, uh, or maybe we've been, you know, post-traumatic stress or whatever. Uh, but the, but there are things that m make more sense once you've been inside that look like nonsense if you've not been inside. And I imagine, in the same way, when I hear people who've only been inside talking about the academy, there's a lot of things that to them make no sense about the academy. Aaron, so, I'd be curious to get your reaction to that. Uh, I mean, I think. I don't know if insider and outsider is, is the right choice. Um, there does come a point, um, particularly if you're interested in Washington and if you want to be a deputy assistant secretary of something, um, they don't just have everybody submit their SAT scores or their transcripts and pick the smartest kid in the bunch. Um, they look at what you did on the campaign. They, they usually want you to have worked on their campaign. Um, they don't, you know, there's a partisan choice that, that has to be made. Um, a different way, though, of thinking about insider and outsider, who here was an Olin fellow? There's more than that. Yeah. I mean, we're dating there, ourselves, though. Yes, because that doesn't exist anymore. Um, there's, um, I have lots of beautiful hair here, Peter. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the insider outsiderness is, is not just about DC or academia, right? It is about, you know, do you, is, is, is an access question. Whether you're allowed to criticize other insiders, that is difficult in Washington. I would have to, for a whole variety of really good professional reasons, in the same way, do junior faculty at the University of Chicago get tenure by criticizing John Mearsheimer? Uh, history suggests not really. Um, you know, these, these insider, outsider, or hierarchical dynamics, you know, apply in a lot of different uh, domains. But it's tricky in Washington. There are rewards for loyalty there that don't exist in academia. Uh, and there are incentives, and, and they're real. I mean, loyalty in Washington is also very rare to find it, to find genuine loyalty. And so there's a reason why that, that is rewarded. By a dog. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, that, the, the quote actually really resonates with me. Uh, so I'm an outsider. Um, and started a, a, a very academic project about 10 years ago called Aid Data. Um, and until three years ago was serving both as sort of 
you know, an intellectual leader within that organization, but also as the chief operating officer. And I can think of two or three very, very big mistakes that I made, and now they're, they're mistakes now from the point of view of the insiders, but they're mistakes that cost us time, they cost us money, they cost us access to data, because I fully embraced and lived uh, an academic culture where you question everything and it's a sign of respect to challenge uh, someone that is, you're engaged with. And it was extremely costly. Two or three years ago, hired people who were from Washington. They actually, two had master's degrees and one a PhD from policy schools. And the way that we operate now with our, with our partners at the OECD and the World Bank and USAID is very different. And I am often restrained. So they'll always listen to tyranny behind closed doors and take my substantive advice, but when it comes time to engaging with the insiders, I'm not allowed to talk to them. And I think that's the right, I think that's absolutely the right, the right decision. So there's definitely a, a big difference in the cultures. Some people need to stay in their, their own box and others are, are likely good bridgers. And uh, I've just learned that I'm not a good bridger. Thank you. That's a great question.